Okay, so a little bit about uh, me. Um, I uh, moved into a townhouse uh, in 2016. And at that time, I wasn't, I never really thought about amateur radio, whether that was anything I was interested in or not. Uh, my brother was doing it. And at the time, I was a little unsure why, but I, uh, I thought, uh, huh. Uh, but anyway, I decided to get a tech license mostly because I wanted to use HTs when hiking. Uh, my brother was, we were hiking uh, together, but sometimes split up with uh, our different groups. And it was nice to be able to uh, talk to each other. And so I talked my wife, Melody, into getting a license too, so we can communicate. But during the process, I found things really interesting. So uh, I just kept studying and thought, ah, I'll take the general uh, and extra exams. And I did that a whole month later. And that was a lot of, uh, I, I just found it interesting. So that's what I did. Now, my uh, presentation isn't, isn't really technical. It's, it's just some antennas I've used. Uh, and uh, definitely Glenn has convinced me that improvements are possible, but at least these do uh, work to some extent. Uh, so I'm in a townhouse. And it seemed like my options were indoor configurations or some kind of temporary outdoor. I didn't think I could erect anything in a permanent sense. There's a little tiny backyard that we have at the townhouse, but you know, it's very small. So what I'm currently using, there's four different uh, antennas. I've got two that I use indoors. One is a mag loop, which has come up in each one of these presentations. And I also have a dipole. And outdoors, I use something called an alpha. Uh, they call it FMJ, which stands for, I think, full metal jacket vertical, which is a vertical with a uh, kind of a mystery matching network. And I also use the ARRL uh, infed, infed half wave kit, but I trim the wire for a shorter length. And I don't use an external antenna tuner for any of these things. Okay, this book is what I guess I was my first reference. I started looking at it to see what the options were. So yeah, because HOA is one of the things, but small spaces is, is really the key as well. Uh, I don't have room for anything else. So this is the front of the townhouse. And my shack is in this the left side there where it's labeled and when i use a mag loop it's over on the on the right side there and you can kind of see how the the townhouses are, are are staggered so the good news is i put the loop there it's not real close to a neighbor or anything like that the townhouse is made out of stucco but it doesn't have the mesh screen uh, faraday cage issue So this is the mag loop in that spare bedroom. Uh, this is the alpha loop, so it's from alpha antennas and 40 to 10 meters. And it has an extra thing you can attach, a, a second loop uh, that allows it to do 80 meters. And there's a lot, there are power limits to the thing. Uh, 25 watts digital, 50 watts CW. And they say 100 watts SSB, as long as you don't peak the ALC. So they're kind of pushing things there. And if you use the 80 meter double loop, it goes down to five watts digital and the uh, other power levels are lower too. Uh, but uh, you can also use this outdoors. The challenge is tuning it because this is a manually tuned loop. There's just a knob there, as you can see. So this is from that book I was showing, uh, talking about an indoor dipole. And it showed how you could kind of put one in a room around the, the length there and fold it in unusual ways. And it will still work. It will change the propagation characteristics somewhat. I suspect you get some cancellation and you get some various uh, features, but, uh, but anyway, it said you can do it. So I thought, okay, that's neat. So I wanted to build a, dipole and I started thinking well I want to operate on several bands 
Uh, so for the indoor dipole, um, I, I did decide that 20 meters was probably the uh, lowest band I was going to realistically use. But I thought, uh, well, what I can do is I can at, make all these segments and connect them together. And since it's right here in the room, I can just step on a little uh, step stool and connect to whatever length I want and operate on that band. And you can't really do that if it's in your attic or something like that. But since it's in the room, you can do that. Um, so I have these little 3M things that are holding it up against the ceiling and you can take those down without messing up your wall. And I put in a ballon and if I didn't have the, if I used uh, just a uh, gamma match or something like that, the first one I had was just a 20 meter plane dipole. I did find that the feed line positioning changed things. So the ballon did help that, did help isolate the antenna characteristics from the feed line. And you can see my shack on the leftmost picture here. And so the radio is right there. And so the feed line is very short. So this shows kind of the connections and how they are. And as I trimmed them, so I just started at the low end, trimmed it, added a segment, trimmed it for each band that I was using. Okay, and this uh, this type of dipole works best probably on the higher bands if you're pursuing a DX. Um, because again, the takeoff angle as, uh, as Glenn was talking about can for horizontal polarization can kind of be too high if uh, if you're closer to the ground. But, uh, but uh, as this uh, townhouse is positioned on 10 meters, uh, 16 feet, you're pretty much there for the, for the uh, higher bands at a halfway, halfway in length-ish. So one thing also to think about if you're operating with an indoor antenna, especially as you saw, I was, uh, my operating position next to this dipole is really close. So for a dipole, uh, I use the Lake Washington Ham Club calculator and 20 watts. And based on that, I can get, uh, looks like about 2.3 feet away from it um, or 3.2 feet away from it for the uncontrolled environment. So I, at least I know my neighbors are all plenty far away. And I think my head is at least four feet away. Uh, mag loops can have a very high RF density in, in the near field. So that's an issue there as well. And I'll talk a little bit about the tuning issues there. <clears throat> and uh, I, I try to make the calculations conservative because I also think there are coupling and other things when you're operating indoors that, I don't know, sometimes I wonder how well these basic calculators work. So it would be really nice to be able to measure it, but I haven't found any practical way to do that. So I just am conservative in how much power I use. So on that dipole, I only use 20 watts. I don't use it anymore. Uh, one option I thought about is going to some kind of remote scheme. Uh, so there's, you know, there's certainly a way to do that. I can uh, uh, set up a remote desktop and, and operate from some distance from the antenna. So um, the mag loop has been treated quite a bit is um, they have this very narrow bandwidth high Q. And one of the things I wanted to do is avoid unwanted transmission during the tuning. And there's two reasons for that. One is since it's a very narrow bandwidth, you want to tune pretty much on the frequency you're going to operate. But if you're like trying to do FT8 or something where the band is really clogged, I didn't really want to start transmitting things at a particular frequency. And the other thing is that while you're transmitting and turning the knob, uh, you're, you're very close to the antenna. So there's RF exposure. And so what do you do if you're some distance between the transceiver and the antenna, how do you, how do you tune it? And one way is you could switch in an antenna analyzer near the, near the uh, loop for the final tuning. I think as it was described earlier, you kind of tune it roughly for noise and then tweak it 
uh, either for SWR or transmit or by transmitting. But another solution is to use a, a remote camera with a noise bridge. This is what I do. And it's interesting, the new QST magazine has this uh, MFJ matchmaker in it. I've been using it for quite a while. And I use an old iPhone and point at the waterfall display on my IC7300. And I turn on the noisemaker and I go into the opposite room and use one of these, I don't know, baby cam monitor apps on my other iPhone. And I can tune the, or turn the knob and just watch the noise drop on the uh, waterfall display. And I'm not transmitting anything at all. And when I do that, it seems to be pretty much tuned right on. So I think these uh, this matchmaker is very handy if you're using a, a manually tuned loop, you know, one where there's just a knob on it and it's not remotely tuned. Okay, so outdoors. Uh, this one's the Alpha FMJ. <clears throat> and one thing about it is it sets up really quickly. Uh, so it's got this matching network. You can kind of see that cylinder there. And it has a, a small footprint. And you can set this thing up in just a very short amount of time, and it takes very little space. Uh, it's certainly not stealth in the sense you can see it. So there it is from the backyard or just outside the backyard. But since it's only up while I'm operating, I take it right back down. And you can just take the top part off. Uh, I don't think anybody's ever going to bother me about it because it's not up except occasionally and it's not like any permanent installation. Uh, the AAR, ARRL kit at 6995, uh, their normal uh, configuration is a 66 foot wire, which I think gives it a multi band capability. Uh, I don't remember what they are 40, 17, something. I don't know what they are. But what I did is I just didn't have enough room for that. So uh, I'm using separate wire lengths. You just, in the same way as the dipole, you just make a wire for the length you're gonna use. Uh, so far I only have 20 or 17, but I'll, I'll make some more. And I use a vertical mast, uh, uh, one of these collapsible fiberglass things. And it goes up 33 feet. So I raise it all the way up for uh, for the 20 meter band. They're really flimsy, but it works good for this. But I wouldn't put it up in the wind. I just bungee it to the fence. So this is kind of what it looks like. <clears throat> yeah, just bungee the, the little uh, uh, transformer to the fence. And I bungee the mast to the fence and raise it up and use it pretty much like a vertical. I've, uh, you know, I've experimented with it, slanting it, and you know, the, the, I think the tendency to believe is that a vertical has, is a little noisier. Uh, I haven't noticed a lot of difference on how uh, when I oriented it differently, but uh, this is the way I usually have used it. So the the uh, element is actually kind of hanging there, but mostly vertical. Okay, so do these antennas work? And I'll say yes. Of course, uh, the fine print is, I use mostly digital modes. Uh, and I expected when I got this stuff that those were gonna be the modes that I would experiment with most. I didn't expect that I could, with any antenna situation I had, I'd get on there and talk uh, to other countries SSB, but who knows, maybe someday. So using some of these digital modes, uh, mostly FT8, but some of the others as well. I've got 55 countries in all continents and uh, cycle 55, solar cycle should, should improve things on these higher bands. Uh, so here's, I did, I took one day, this is July 2nd, and you can see the characteristics, solar flux index that it was an 88, and it said the geomagnetic magnetic field was unsettled, and then later on it was quiet because there was a bit of a, solar, a minor solar disturbance, I guess. This is a 20, 20 watts on 20 meters, 17 meters. And you know, it's certainly working. Uh, you can see that uh, even just operating indoors. 
And this is the alpha loop at 25 watts. I think, yeah, these comparisons I have, they're all 25 watts just tried to be consistent except the dipole, which was 20. On this particular day anyway. And this is the FMJ vertical at 25 watts. The one thing about it and the NFED is when you're outdoors, I, I can turn up the power beyond that. So it, it, I don't always stick to just 25 watts. I might run 50 or 60 or something like that even. But I wanted to be more or less consistent. This uh, 17 meter result, which was only going east, I think was largely just because of where I had the antenna positioned. So I did another experiment a few days later, moved it over, and I think it was just getting blocked by the by the building itself. So I don't think that's necessarily that much of a characteristic. And then this is the NFED halfway. This is again all the same day as quickly as I could switch them. Um, again, uh, with just 25 watts. Uh, this is my brother's setup. I thought I'd just throw this in because he also has an HOA situation. He is in the house. But uh, so he mounts his antennas on a on uh, the back deck. And one of these is called the ProMaster, which is also alpha antennas. He just lays it down when he's not using it. And then he's also got his BHF, UHF on a telescoping mast. And he just lowers it when he's not using it. And the installation is very complicated. You can see he uses hose clamps and clamps it to the edge of his, of his deck. And you can see the left picture there is the VHF, UHF in the lowered position. And then on the right, it's I mean, he's raising it. So that's just stuff. And I think that's all I have. Yep. I will stop sharing unless somebody has any comments or questions. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. Does anybody have any questions for Glenn or Mark? Big hand, big hand. <laughs> This presentation was brought to you by the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club. For more information, visit our website, ncarc.net. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.